I'll introduce myself. I'm Garrett Collins. I'm one of the project leads on the Nisgar project. I work on it with Peter Clymer, uh, who's also a project lead on it. And today, Susan Topol is also with us. She's our communications and director, our director of communications and marketing. And then Kat, publishing, publishing marketing, that sort of stuff. Susan <laughs>
content doesn't need to be presented at a course level for it to be useful. And so we're trying to explore what ways can we do that. Kind of complicated, but I'm in 741, 541, I think. That's what the number is, the web system. Yeah, yeah. 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 and uh, that's it. Yeah. Well, well uh, I guess the ICO seminar and the uh, uh, that's the technology study seminar, okay. uh, which is like Racker 571. Okay. The, and I don't know what the ICO is. Does that mean my name's uh, Dave Malafi, I'm a first semester student, uh, focusing on. Essentially, we double yeah. <laughs> what we are. Yeah. All right, so the rest of the meeting, then, what we're going to do is I'm going to start talking a little bit about the current landscape of what open courseware is, open educational resources. <coughs> we'll talk about specifically the DSCRAB model and how we engage in creating open educational resources here at the University of Michigan, and then get pretty much into the logistics behind what it means to participate this semester. Of course, interrupt any time with questions that, that you might have. And we've got a lot of time at the end of it to speak openly about stuff. So the first question I want to ask of you guys, how many people have actually heard of OpenCourseWare and or used OpenCourseWare? All right, so great. So then that means a lot of you will be familiar with what MIT did nearly eight years ago, which was to say, we're going to publish all of our courses online and make those courses available to people free of charge for, yeah, for anyone to access around the world. I'm sure that you guys recently know then that MIT celebrated the publication of their 1800th course where it was sort of you know, basically a huge achievement to say, as an institution, we, we publish as many courses as possible, and of course, they're still continually published more. One of the unique things you guys may not know about is that MIT has inspired a lot of you know, institutions around the United States to get involved in also creating open course style content. We're one of those institutions. That they spread from Utah to California to out east. So another thing is that They've also inspired a, a number of international institutions to get involved in creating open course. And a large number of those actually are in Asia. Um, and, and you guys are probably familiar with some of these. And, and even a, core, a project in China that you guys may be familiar with is, is called CORE, where they've actually translated a number of M MIT resources into Chinese and made that available um, as open education resources. Another interesting thing around about this project in general, in terms of open course or open educational resources, is that people get together around what's called the Open Courseware Consortium. It's sort of a think tank of sorts where people get together to share ideas, talk about best practices, talk about where to go next with, with the whole movement in general. And that's something we're, we're actively a part of, contributing sort of to discussions around how to get people engaged and what resources to create to actually talk to members of your institution and faculty and stuff like that. Here's a neat sort of graph that shows who's engaging in public publishing materials. You can see MIT on the bottom here in the blue at their 1800 mark, but there's the rest of the other international and domestic institutions actually um, publishing course materials. And so it's really neat to see the wave again that they've inspired. We've got 15 of those. Yes. <laughs> and more to come. <coughs> so the question then maybe so we can talk a little bit about is why would an institution want to engage in creating open courseware to begin with? In a large, in large part, we talk about this benefit that comes to students from being able to publish materials uh, openly. And one of those is, is that idea that you can you can browse courses and shop for courses, so to speak. You can see what projects are are, are being uh, undertaken by students. You can see faculty members' presentations. You can look at the syllabus from years past. The idea being that you get a real in-depth look at these courses to make better decisions about your own academic career. There's benefits.
just the faculty, right? They get to show other people what they're engaged in. They have new opportunities for collaboration with other individuals, not only on campus, but across you know, other departments and other institutions. There's this benefit to alumni, where if I'm interested in what's happening in 502 or 539, I can see the transition of that course and come back to it. And, and not only just see the, the course description and how that's changed, but actually engage with the materials and potentially conduct, continue my education as I go forward. There's this quote, you know, in that same vein as sort of the self-learners, those people who are really interested in perhaps learning something like French, who could, you know, go to a website and, and look up various instructional activities, but at the same time, you can come to a place like MIT or the University of Michigan and find a course and, and actually follow it, provide a really interesting structure. There's a benefit to the university. It suggests that the university is actually engaged and open and wanting to actually share knowledge beyond just their, their, their community here or local community, but basically say that they're a world partner in helping educate people. And then there's this a whole other, you know, you know, there's a lot of other people that this benefits. I don't really have to talk about that. So the question then became, or is, how do institutions engage in creating open courseware materials? And there's generally this staff-centric model that's in place in a lot of these institutions where a dedicated series of staff members are hired to sort of act as the people who look at the materials, review them for intellectual property concerns, edit them and get them up on, online for people to access. And they also liaise with the faculty members and, and members of the legal team or technology team. There's obvious challenges to that model. Uh, the costs involved in that are actually quite high. They find a staff and you know, they pay them a dedicated salary each year and that staff might grow from five to 10 to 15 people. We're talking about something that doesn't necessarily scale at a large institution such as the University of Michigan. At, at MIT, you find that it, it, it does, but they also have a lot of funding, or at least had a lot of funding to make that happen. There's that question of scale that I just mentioned as well. As, you, as, as there's more courses that are there, you, you run into the challenge of actually finding how to actually make open course or happen across so not only 1,800 courses, but something like 4,000 courses. There's that access to faculty question. That, that, that small series of staff members, maybe 15 people, if they're having to deal with 300 faculty members, there's really not there's not a lot of communication going on. You can imagine there being a lot of a lot of responsibility and a lot of a lot of communication is probably lost. And then the question of refresh rate. Those 15 people, if they're responsible for publishing 2,000 courses each semester, you're not probably going to get 2,000 courses a semester. You're going to find they can only handle 200, and then they'll have to go into another 200, another 200. So those are some of the challenges that are associated with that staff-centric model. When Pete and I first in, became involved in the project, that was sort of where we were at. We knew that other people were engaged in creating open courseware. We knew that they had a staff-centric model. And our question was, how else can we do this? And what, we, what we sort of brainstormed with uh, as students here, with a faculty member named Joseph Harden, was maybe we can use students to get them involved in, in actually creating open courseware content. And so what we came up with was something called the DSCRAP publishing model. The goal of, of that model, again, relies on that idea that this is something that needs to be scalable. It needs to be able to go across the entire university. It needs to be sustainable. It's got to be something that can happen each semester and, and not only see that staff members like ourselves can be engaged, but that this can, this can continue long after staff members perhaps aren't there. And it's also something we thought we wanted to have it be participatory. We want to get people engaged in new ways of thinking about content. That means faculty and students as well as staff. And of course, approaches being, we can, what tasks can we actually automate in this whole process? We know that people are doing a lot of manual things, but well, what skills can we bring to this actually to make a lot of these processes more simple? And then obviously leverage the sort of talents that already exist on campus by utilizing things like the you know, open source software development teams that are here, thinking about the repositories of content that are already sitting here, and other projects as, as well. So then, what are describes? Describes are students like you who are motivated, right? Your job is basically to look at the content that's being taught in your class and figure out how to organize it, clear it, tag it, and basically get it up online. You're familiar with that technology. You're familiar with technology and software, right? You're engaged in this. You're students at SI. You're actually probably curious about what intellectual property is. You're, you, you've heard about Creative Commons. You're thinking about copyright questions when you're posting content online. You're interested perhaps in utilizing new software that we've used and actually helping develop new software by conducting in small usability studies that we do. Maybe you're also just interested in, in engaging in your own content in new ways, looking not only at what's being taught, but how it's being taught, how it's being constructed. So with that, 
let's talk about the describe publishing cycle. So this is it in its sort of entirety. But what I'm going to do is go through kind of slide by slide and show you a small cartoon about how it actually works. So we have this cast of characters, right? We've got you as describes. We have the faculty member who you're in the course with. And then you have describe two is like Kathleen, Pete, and myself. And then there's these other members of the team that I mentioned, like the developers and the legal team, who aren't on, the, on these slides. But this is the core of the, the sort of process. Here's how it works. At the beginning of the semester, I, I'm talking with your faculty members, getting to know them and, and what they're teaching, but then also mainly just helping them license their material under a Creative Commons license. It says, here's how you can let others know how to use your material. What are you comfortable with publishing? Just the lectures, just the syllabus, whatever. So I, I, once I gather that information, we're looking then for students like yourselves who will engage with that faculty member over the course of the semester to work with him or her to get these materials up. Once we've found those describes, what we're going to do is have a training course. And so I mentioned Wednesday. That's what's going to happen this Wednesday, where we basically just get into the meat of what we're talking about when we talk about describing. Well, you'll learn about copyright in its basic form so that we can understand what we're actually looking for inside of these lecture materials. We're going to learn about open resource repositories, where we can find, excuse me, where we can find alternative content. So sort of databases like Flickr, where there's actually content that you can see that's, that's open, it's licensed in ways for you to use it. You know, we're going to also learn a little bit about sort of the decision trees that we've made to sort of help guide you in the process of looking at course materials. And it's fun, as, as, uh, as those two describes say. Next, we figure out how the faculty member will transfer those materials to you over the course of the semester. Most of you will probably just go to a C-Tool site, download it, and upload it to uh, what we have uh, as, a, as a tool to work with. Some of you might have an email exchange. Some of you might bring your USB key to the presentation. But that's something we'll establish with the faculty member first. Then what, once it's transferred to your own machine, what you're going to do is basically vet these materials. And this is the training we'll, we'll help you with. Basically, how do you look at these materials? What are you looking for? What, what merits concern? And once you've pulled something out that merits concern, we put it into something we call ORCA. And now ORCA is a piece of software that we've developed to help manage the process of, of bringing in content and then talking with the faculty member about provenance issues. Where, where does that material come from? Did you take that photo? Did, what, what's the citation on that? It also is a tool that we use to communicate with the Descript too. So if you've got a question about something where you're saying, yeah, I really don't know what to do with this. I mean, you could do that through email, but we use the tool to capture that so that we can learn from the experience and build on it. The next thing that happens is that you review that material with the faculty members and the Descript too. It's basically what I just described. Over the, course of the, over the course of the semester, you'll do that, but also the idea being each week, once you're looking at that content, it'll come to us and we can engage in conversations about it. Once you're ready and done clearing it, you basically edit that material to sort of put in a replacement image or take an image out or do whatever else you need to do to make that material ready to get out there in a way that we know that it can be distributed. <coughs> and once the faculty member then has had an opportunity to look at it and give it a final review, then it's handed over to Susan and basically her team and it, it works to get this material up and online. So Susan has a team? Well the team being <laughs> me and you. <laughs> and Susan. But yeah, the idea being as it scales though, Susan <coughs> again, you can't bottleneck it at one person. We're gonna need more people to assist Susan in that process. So logistics. As I mentioned, we've got this uh, training course that's gonna happen Wednesday. And I hesitate to call it training course so much as the let's get started and do this course, where we'll basically take your first lecture, sit down with it, and figure out what to do and how to get it up there. We can talk over the course of the semester around these themes around copyright and intellectual property. We can talk about what's happening in the open course for a movement. We can continue to talk about the interest areas that you might have with regard to sort of your you know, area of interest within archives or within HCR or whatever it might be, and figure out how those can be integrated into our process. And even just not only what we're doing, but what other people around the nation and internationally are doing. Because there's some really interesting things uh, and projects to get involved with. We're going to have a couple of students doing independent studies with us. Some will be focusing on the policy angle, for instance. So if there's something that you are really, you know, this catches your eye, that's something we can still craft in the next uh, two weeks. And there's also an opportunity to get credit for this if you're not already enrolled in Joseph's, uh, Joseph Harden's 521 Special Topics course. He's, in, he's agreed to sort of use the project's component of that course as a way for individuals to describe a course and get credit for it. So if that's something that you know, you're know you already taking, consider this as an option in order if you're interested in learning a little bit more about what the open movement's all about, take his class as well. Three important details, though. If you're going to do this, we're going to need to know pretty soon which course and which faculty member you're going to want to work with. So that means
means that we can send him or her an email. If I haven't already, they get, get started on that process of licensing, licensing the material. The next question would be, can you attend our Wednesday 12 to 2 uh, work session? And that will not only be for next week, but that will be ongoing throughout the semester. We will also kind of create an, another time that will work with people that might be Wednesday evening. We'll see. And then obviously the most, one of the most important questions is whether or not you're vegetarian. Because each, each, well, each work session will be a lunch session as well. We'll provide, we'll provide food. So um, with that, I want to sort of turn it over to you guys and have you ask us any questions around open in general or something related to the DSCAR process. Uh, I have two sort of general questions. Yep. Um, have uh, professors been totally uh, interested in posting their presentations and stuff? And uh, second, um, uh, do you have any I, way of measuring or do you have any sense of how, how people, uh, for example, of those 1,800 MIT courses, how many of them have been looked at by users? Right, I'll take the first one if you want to take the second one. Sure. I mean, it's, in terms of faculty members' interest, the reason why we're at SI is because this sort of started here. Um, we're not the first ones to think of doing open courseware. And so we're building on large part on efforts that others have already done. So the, the conversation is, is definitely taking place here around, around what it means to open one's course up. And so there are faculty members who, you know, even though they've heard of it, are resistant, only because perhaps they have other ways of making that material available, whether it's on their own website or, or and, and we've kind of res we haven't had much resistance from people who said, I absolutely don't want to do it. Um, now, if you take your question and put it in other departments, you find a, di a really different answer. And so there is a lot of backlash against it. People are saying, you know, I don't, I'm not really sure what it means to be open. I'm not sure what it means to bring my course materials out there. I'm afraid of other people looking at it. I'm afraid of what people might think. Or if I'm, and a lot of questions are actually revolving around the intellectual property stuff. What happens if my material goes out there? Somebody says, we didn't get it right. Do I get sued? You know, so the, I mean, those are some of the questions that prevent people from really engaging the process. But working with our legal team <coughs> and figuring out how to create documents to talk with those faculty members, more and more people come on board with sort of a, okay, this is something that, that I can see the benefit of, so. I just want a second question, oh. I was gonna say, did you want to mention the medical school? <coughs> in terms of the difficult. In, in terms of faculty support. Yeah, I mean, so the medical school is an interesting context because they're, again, they're, they're, the, the big issue that they had was around liability. I mean, the question of, I'm, I'm teaching about a certain medication, and what if I said, you know, something like take these sort of doses, and then somebody went and, downloaded the lecture and did that, would they be held responsible for telling somebody to take two doses of epinephrine during some, you know, who knows? I mean, that, those are sort of the resistant questions mm -hmm. that we would get. And sort of working with, again, the legal team to sort of assuage some of those concerns, it's, it, it's a slow process, but, um, you know, it, it's slow to happen. But there will be a critical mass yeah. point. Yeah, it's just a matter of getting there. Um, <clears throat> to answer your second question, MIT has uh, a lot of interesting stats if you go to their website uh, about who uses what, um, but it's it's not uh, as comprehensive uh, as I'd like it to be. Um, <clears throat> but and, and I can't give you a percentage of you know the courses that are looked at. Or, uh, I mean, as you can figure, there's there's some sort of functional effect where kind of the major um, kind of general physics courses are going to be real high uh, usage, and then as you taper off into the real niche areas, uh, you won't see as much use. Uh, but they do get about 2 million, I think, unique visits to their site every month, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty huge. Uh, and even with the 10 courses that we've had up, we get probably 1,000, 1,200 hits each month. Um, and that's, I mean, that's nothing. There's almost no content there. Uh, but how is that being used? We haven't, we haven't begun to evaluate our own um, MIT has done some evaluation, but I think that that's a perfect uh, place for SI students, SI researchers, to start really looking in depth. Um, how, how could we use this content? What's what's the best way to present it? Uh, what would people actually want? So that's that's kind of we're at the beginning stages of looking at that.
replicate very easily is the syllabus and schedule and things like that. I mean, this <coughs> doesn't work as well in the context of those. those right. Unless, yeah, unless you have video. Right. right. And, and everyone in the classroom can sense to being a part of the video mm -hmm. recording right. that you can post. Well, there's also student projects. And, and one thing that we really we'd like to start doing is getting um, student contributed content. So I mean, if there's, I don't know, I know in some classes we'd have like kind of group notes, at, you know, where, where we get everyone's notes at the end of the week summarized and then posted somewhere. Getting something like that for, for a lot of these discussion courses would be really helpful for people. And I, I mean, I'll say on that, sometimes it's not about the depth of the material, it's, it's sometimes just about the, the fact that it's there. So, I mean, see, oh, five, you know, 540 is there, even though it doesn't have an amazing depth, at least it's what we can give now, and it builds sort of a structure on which we can build. Yeah, I mean, just publishing some of those things like it's possible. Like, 
this, is, this in some ways is, a, is kind of a class. We get to meet and talk about some really interesting stuff. That's not only your content, but that's sort of all the stuff that we're mentioning in terms of what is the open movement? What's, what is creative commons? How does this work? What is, you know, how does this scale around the university? Like, what, what, what is happening in this realm? So if that's stuff that you're interested in, this sort of serves as just like two hours during the week for us to not only look at your content and get, to get some of your major questions answered, but to actually engage in a, a kind of a really neat conversation around what's actually happening, and then provide you with links to people and, and projects and things that, that are, that are of, uh, in that vein of interest. So um, we're not new to this scene, so to speak. Uh, so it, and, it, and having conversations with you about your interests obviously helps refine our process and figure out what we're doing and, all, and, 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 and basically better what we're doing as well. So. You had a question, and did you get answered? <laughs> single year they talked about that yeah. at C-Tools, okay. is how can we just make that portion of the course open, openly accessible, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, copyrighted content kind of behind the closed door. And they just, they haven't done it yet, it hasn't been a high enough priority, but apparently that's that's one of their top priorities over the next year. Sure. Uh, but, you know, we'll see where that goes. Uh, but again, that's one, one major distinction that we want to make here is open access and kind of reusable. O open as in reusable. Um, we're trying to make things reusable. So it's, it's great to have access to it, but if you can't if you can't pull it out, put it in your own context, build from it, then it doesn't have as much uh, use for society. And so that's that's the direction that we're pushing. So we're, we're trying to make things as, at least as, as less restrictive. And then in terms of you can't make each week's meeting, we, we found that through experience, like it really helps to meet each week with a Describe 2. What if I can make like one hour of a month too? Right, so <laughs> then the, in that case, what we might be able to do is like, one, you know, if you come prepared well enough to say, here's, here's what I've got for my hour, fantastic. We also might say, hey, we're going to have a secondary session that might work better for you, where you can, you can work with that team on, on clearing stuff and getting questions answered. Because again, when you're, when you're, in the meat of it, sometimes it really helps to have a little bit more input from your fellow students, but then also uh, also the Describe 2 that's working with you. In the past, we've been very flexible. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we have, we're always available evenings, you know, most weekends, <laughs> so, so by phone. So. So um, most people kind of break it down sort of as, as Garen had before, where you have uh, faculty who are either trying to sort of catch up on what anyone else is doing in their field, or they're trying to create a course, or you know, they want some direction. Okay. Um, you have students within that university who are using it to sort of preview and, and engage what might be taught in that course. Um, you're going to have sort of self-learners, people who actually want to take the course, but you know, don't have access to you know, view of them necessarily for tuition or whatever, and so they, they try to go through the materials. Um, and then the fourth one is typically alumni uh, or alumni slash business professionals who are just kind of interested in the topic and want to keep in touch and stay tuned. But again, we one thing that we really want to do is some sort of evaluation to understand our own user types and uh, provide content that's uniquely interesting to each of those groups. Um, are you guys, uh, is this your job? Are you guys high students? Oh, yeah. So what, is the permanent, what is the permanent structure of the operation? Yeah. So, <coughs> we, 
you said the thing of a timeline is that Pete and I were both students here, and during our first year, we got involved in the project, and then became so involved with the project that we decided to graduate early to take a job in the med school, where they were saying, And that hey, was December 2007. Yeah, so they, and they said, we want to do this, we think your model might work, you know, come work with us and see if it does. So we basically, we do work for the medical school. They have a, a strong interest in, you know, seeing their entire medical school curriculum available um, to folks outside the university. So that's our first priority, but that, that's a project that we engage in on the summer, during the summer with med students, and then work throughout the year to sort of get faculty on board and whatnot. Um, and then in terms of uh, in terms of the permanence of it, basically, I mean, who knows? I mean, we know, we know that this process will evolve, right? So what we're creating here hopefully begins something that, you know, that spreads to other places, maybe the School of Information decides to create their own office, or Public Health creates their own office, and that we can fade away or to change completely into something that's, it's like Pete said, more of a service model where, you know, we help facilitate others to do these sort of things. So, I think the permanence is more in the idea yeah. than the, the structure of how it's done. And, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, certainly, you know, it's way it's going to work. Yeah. Or it's just when it's sort of on the ground. So, and do you, you are also employed as yeah. yeah, so I was going to say, well, Susan's the, the third full-time employee. Um, did you introduce Susan yeah. before I got here? Okay. So I got here late. I'm Kathleen Ludwig. I'm a current SI student as well as a public policy student, and I work with them half-time as a PSRA. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, again, when I mentioned the other team members, like Pete and I are the two, or, and Susan being the three full-time faculty members engaged in the open coursework project. So what is that? You just promoted yourself. You said faculty. Oh, I did? <laughs> um, but then, of course, you know, with, with other developers that work in our office, you know, they, they, there's a lot of people that contribute part time. So, they, and, and that's probably how the model will work. So, we have a small staff of core sure. folks and then others that contribute. So. One thing I want to mention is like, like around the timing of, of this, of, of uh, how much time it will take you, it's really going to depend on the course that you're in. So, like Matt mentioned, if it's just a syllabus and and you know some reading lists for that course, because the, the there's no PowerPoint presentations, you, you're probably going to spend five minutes a week on the project. You know, if it's if it's or two hours actually coming to the meetings and hanging out. <laughs> but you know, if it's a class where there's a lot of images, that might take you longer. But that means then we'll also help work with you because we realize the workload, and that also might mean that Matt chips in on helping you out because he only has five minutes of work with you. So, you know, but the idea being that we can distribute some of this and distribute some of the tasks, but it's not, the onus of getting these things up isn't just on you. So. Uh, I'll So that, that, that would be part of the sort of process in the EQ is to add metadata. Um, and it's, that's going to be at the image level. So it, we call those content objects. And so you'll add metadata for a particular image. You'll add a citation for it. And if there's a license for it, copyright information, you'll add that as well. But then you know, we, we also would have metadata for the lecture and the metadata for the course. Um, so we, we, we need to build that. <clears throat> what we actually really need is uh, team of dedicated students who are really interested in making that job easy. Uh, we thought about it a little, quite a bit, and a lot of people have thought about metadata attachment and how difficult it is, but uh, we think that there's got to be some sort of solution, um, a game of some sort, where we could distribute that across anyone in the class, mm -hmm. where you don't even need to be a D-scribe, you could just be a part of the class and just add tags for your own course, and it's not really that much effort. So Darren mentioned uh, Orca, uh, which is a piece of software that we use, and it's, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't get into it, but um, it's just a piece of web-based oh, software right. that we use to manage the content. And, and it also manages some of the interactions between Describes and Describe 2s. 
Yeah, yep, yep, you can definitely just show up.